many, many years ago, uh, when, when David Ed got started, you know, Asco were doing you know, these little mini plays and things like that. One of the things they did was David Dead, and then there was a couple of Mexicanos that Karen was working with, uh, uh, Carlos Bueno and Antonio Ibarra, that brought Day of the Dead, the Mexican thing, and so you had the hybridization taking place. And it wasn't going to be completely Mexican. I mean, that was the basic fact with Karen and those guys. Is that, you know, they just wanted to do what they wanted to do. They didn't understand public, you know, and it comes from the Mexican background. Uh, but she understood public. And there's nothing more public than near the moment decorating his truck with this big, huge beard in uh, Galacas and whatnot, and driving it down Brooklyn Avenue on the way to Evergreen. And I remember that because that's iconic. In fact, even the photograph of that is iconic because it was taken by uh, Harry Gamboa and others who, you know, uh, a lot of times people don't get that. But that was sort of the thing. But what Karen was saying was that, was that when uh, Charlie came back from New York, Carlos Almaraz, uh, you know, he was a fantastic artist. But he wasn't really oriented toward the whole Chicano thing. He had been from East LA, one of them, you know, he'd been around in the classic community. He was a talented man. He'd gone back east to come back. And Leo took him around. Leo was, you know, critical in helping orient him. And so when people say, you know, well, you know, Amra's influences Leo's work, their work is similar, and you can see the influences. But the reality is, is that Leo influenced some of Amra's work. And has Leo to think, because Leo was doing his bit a long time before. Uh, the other thing too was when he did a piece at Soho, uh, in which he really began to use the stenciling in such a way. The stenciling and the airbrushing that was then translated to the uh, silk screen, that it really pushed the boundary for the guy who was doing the piece, the, 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 car, uh, the printer, uh, the Dwarter, Oscar Dwarter. It made Oscar work harder than he'd ever done before in his life. And it was a big, huge piece um, for the LA 92, LA North American variant, whatever the heck it was in those days. But Leo was pushing the boundary as an artist, and, using, and technique wise. And the people that really know, that were really expert at silk screen, could see it and were impressed by that. So. You know, it's, it's, it's always, you know, it's like when your colleagues vote for you as the most valuable player rather than the public. There's a special thing because it's the people that know. The people that know saw that Leo was pushing the printer and he was pushing the medium. And that was critical. Now, it had been a couple of years since Karen had died, Leo had been out, he started a group called the Islam Cultural Arts Foundation. And it was a group over at the old jail next to Carmen Zapata and BFA. And um, they were a cultural arts group that was being put together a la self-help. In fact, there were some people that were, you know, still angry at me for becoming director. And, and you know, their whole motto was, we'll show you. But Leo never took that attitude. His attitude was, you know, just we're, we're working together and there's plenty to go around. And that was my attitude. So we collaborated with the Aslan Cultural Arts Foundation a lot on a couple of things. And that was very exciting. I mean, he had an executive director that stole money and um, uh, was, a, was a complete jerk. Leo was not going to be the administrator. He wasn't going to be the AD. He was the artistic director and he was the ambassador. And he was very good at that. He was really espousing his philosophy. But the fellow that undercut his wings before doing so uh, was um, pretty capricious. But when it was about me and Leo working together on the uh, slime, and self-help, working in partnership with programming, including youth programming, and building murals and things like that. It was solid. It was great because for a while they really had it going well, and it was great. Uh, he's, he's, he's a master, and, and he's a uh, folkloric hero. He can communicate on both sides, you know. And I think, for lack of a better word, I, I don't think we ever thought in terms of sides. East side and the west side, we, we embraced everything because we have the freeways. Right. They're just the off ramp, USA, right? Off ramp, LA. I think we explored that. We weren't inhibited. Lou was uninhibited. And, and he's a spokesperson for, for us. I'm happy. I'm happy for that. You know, not, people, not too many people can do that. You know? 
in a convincing fashion. Right. And he, he's intergenerational. He can speak many generations without even having, you know, or being just flippant about it. And just say, well, here we are. How about a little cheese man, Leo? <laughs> I think what really is interesting is to me to see Leo's work, since I specialize in pre-Columbian and you know, I do a lot of work in Mexico City and in Central America. Yeah. To see his work is like seeing the pre-Columbian images continue to live in East LA, downtown LA. And I think he has, doesn't go through trends. He doesn't believe in just whatever sells. He believes in what his heart tells him. And I think what is amazing is, again, his aspect of, again, holding on to this aspect of pre-Columbian iconography or images and placing them within the context of 21st century. And so you have the Virgin of Guadalupe dancing or singing or being in festivities, and not as a, a woman, for instance, that deals in, again, as a mother of Catholicism, but the fact of taking the role of a woman and also uh, the figures of pre-Columbian uh, natives, the Aztecs or Mayans, alongside of, you know, televisions. And his work, I think, is really interesting because he was really influenced by television and the way television, you know, during the 50s to 60s, it would blur or the lines would come on. Well, he actually incorporates some of that so that it's like looking, when you look at this canvas, it's like looking at the theater. That is going on as you and I talk, because when you see it, your eyes, it's like a film camera. And so therefore those images come very much alive, and it's so incredible. Now, there was always this question about Chicano art that these images are not really functional, or they really are dead with the movimiento and the, what, happens in the late 60s and early 70s. And Leo's work it continues. It's in his heart, it's in his soul. When you look at Leo Limon's work, it's him. They don't pay him to do a certain image, and that's all he does. He continues to give him himself, very much in the sense even of the Renaissance masters, or the Olivera. And like I said, his work continues to be Leo, it continues to be LA, and very much tied to our Chicano and Mexican roots. I, I think it's incredible, and for him, he's not a sellout. And his work is looking into his soul with Chicano, it's fabulous. I, uh, we met Leo when he was about maybe 16 or 17 years of age. Both uh, Carlos Almaraz and myself uh, were involved uh, early on. I think maybe it was after the Los Four exhibition. So in the, um, uh, you know, 74, 75. And uh, he was a very talented young man. He was with a, um, um, uh, a scholarship fund out of high school that uh, studied uh, drawing and cartooning, and I don't know the name of it, but the director was uh, Ellen Waite, who was the former uh, art director of Westway's magazine. It was a woman who uh, helped, uh, you know, young talent, and, uh, you know, we were very impressed with his drawing. He actually helped us uh, with our, one of my our very first murals, which was on Avenue, I think, forty three something in the forties in, in Highland Park, and it was a very small commission. I think it was six hundred dollars, <laughs> or maybe nine. I got the commission, and uh, uh, Carlos and I were, uh, you know, sharing a, a house at that time. And so uh, Leo you know, was just out of the army, so that was like a few years later. And um, he helped with that mural and was very much involved in, you know, the Los Four movement, which is uh, what I can say um, in terms of, you know, this is uh, uh, the late 70s. 
uh, uh, Lafort did a lot of, uh, you know, murals that time, and he, he was very uh, helpful. And uh, and I think we even did a, a, a comic book, a, a political comic book, that was uh, uh, funded by Liberty Hill Foundation. And uh, he was very instrumental in that. Did a, did a whole article um, uh, with his uh, with uh, his uh, cartooning and drawing skills, and it was very impressive. And uh, you know, uh, I've known him ever since. And I'm sure he, you know he does very well. He, he's 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 a veteran of the Chicano art movement and uh, a very respected artist. Uh, I don't remember how I met him. Um, I haven't known him for 45 years, you know. But over the last decade or so, I've had probably uh, 15 or 20 interactions with him. Um, some casually, some at uh, Day of the Dead event or some Felt Graphics event, uh, some at the uh, an lecture series I used to be involved with where he spoke and he was a regular uh, participant and attendee, uh, and um, for a couple of different oral history projects that I've been involved in, one where I was actually interviewing him about uh, the area under one of the bridges in town over the river and the adjacent river, and then the other when I had the pleasure of working with the studio a little bit on self uh, history. So, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of him, and I'm a fan of his work as well. I think that uh, he is, uh, he's always happy. Every time I've encountered him, he's always so upbeat, pleasant, and smiling, and, um, and, and effusive in praise of everyone and everything, and uh, in a big city you don't get that that much. And so, for the, fa the fact that he's been a, a crucial member of the cultural community here for 45 years you know, or so, I don't mean to, to date him, but uh, I think he came back from his military stint in the mid-70s, uh, and he's such a nice guy, and maybe most importantly, he has an awesome, uh, awesome beard. Uh, you know, uh, you can't beat that combination.